Eh, vamos a tener la segunda presentación del día, a cargo del doctor Gordon Eiri. Eh, ahora lo nombrado en la mañana, eh, Gordon su experiencia, es sudafricano, su experiencia inicial es en, en un famoso centro de investigación en Sudáfrica, CECIR, que, con el cual hemos tenido nosotros, nosotros mucha relación, particularmente por los ensayos acelerados de pavimentos, pero también eh, Gordon desde hace algunos años es el, centro de, es el director del Centro de Investigaciones en Transporte de la Universidad de Nottingham en Inglaterra, que como ustedes saben, hoy día es el centro líder en el campo de los pavimentos en Inglaterra. Eh, ha trabajado muchísimo en materiales, eh, en ensayos dinámicos, en biología de materiales y eh, tiene más de 300 publicaciones científicas en distintos journals, lo cual es un un parámetro muy importante para los que hacemos investigación pura eh, y, y, bueno, en cuenta de investigación aplicada. Tienen gran conocimiento en proyectos, en evaluación mecánica de materiales y también fue directivo de la ISA, que es la International Society of Fossil Payments, donde la NAME también hoy día tiene re representación a través de un servidor desde hace un par de años. Entonces, nos sentimos muy contentos de tener a Gordon aquí. Les pido, por favor, un aplauso para recibirlo. Thank you, Louise, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, let me say how excited I am to have been uh, invited to come give you guys a two-hour lecture this afternoon. But equally, I'm very excited about my opportunity to visit your, your country. It's my first time in Costa Rica. We had opportunity on Sunday to go look at a volcano, and, and I have plans for the rest of the week to hopefully do a bit more sightseeing and get a chance to see a bit more of the country. So thank you again for your kind invitation. It's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to actually be here today with you uh, in terms of this particular seminar and the opportunity to talk a little bit about what I do back in, in Nottingham. So, in terms of uh, the presentation, what I want to try to do is initially talk a little bit about Nottingham. Some of you may not be aware of the University of Nottingham and uh, its location and the kind of things that we've been doing there. I want to talk a little bit about my center the Nottingham Translation Engineering Center and the kind of work that we've been doing at that center for about 60 years. So it's not a new group, it's a relatively old, relatively uh, stable group. I then want to talk a little bit about innovation in terms of what's happening in the UK, in terms of where we see the future in terms of research focus, where we see the future in terms of uh, innovation in the, not only the highway sector, but also the translation sector. I then want to concentrate on two main themes or two main projects and hopefully I'll have enough time to do that. The first one is about moisture damage and in the UK we obviously have a lot of rain. We have some serious issues to do with trying to understand and mitigate against moisture damage. So I want to talk a little bit about that and some of the techniques that we've looked at and the research that we've done in Nottingham over the last 15 years or so. And then at the end I want to talk about something that we're doing at the moment, relatively new exciting stuff looking at uh, self-healing asphalt, how we can design materials that effectively will not only assess their own performance and their own uh, distresses, but effectively heal themselves. So that's quite exciting stuff, and that's some of the stuff that we're doing that, that's fairly new and fairly innovative. So a little bit about the university. Uh, the first thing to say, it's not a university solely placed in the UK. It is what we would call a global university and it probably needs a bit more explanation about that. It's a policy, or, or at least an approach, a philosophy that Nottingham has taken to become a university based not just in the UK, but based in China and in Malaysia. And so the campuses themselves are different. The UK tends, as you would expect, to be the larger campus, about 35,000 students. But there is a second campus in Malaysia with about 5,000 students, and a third campus in China which has about, I think it's about 7,000 students. That's exciting for us, because it allows us obviously to, to engage with students, not just in the UK, but throughout the world. So that's the international global branding that we've been using. So as I was saying, the university campus in Malaysia was the first British university campus outside the UK. So when we started this venture, which was about 15 years ago, it was obviously quite new. Uh, there was a little bit of risk associated with people who actually want to go to the University of Nottingham but be based in a campus that wasn't in the UK. But that's been very, very successful. And so that campus in Malaysia is just north of uh, KL, 
and as I said, attracts about 5,000 students. The university campus in Ningbo is a slightly newer campus. This was the opportunity, and it was the first opportunity of its kind for any university, not just a university from the UK, but any university, to set up uh, an independent campus in uh, mainland China. And this was done through the links that the university had at that particular time with the Chinese government. Uh, our vice chancellor, or sorry, our chancellor at that point was actually a Chinese national. Both those campuses are very similar in that they offer pretty much exactly the same kind of degrees that we get at Nottingham. But it's a good opportunity for us to obviously do something slightly unique, slightly different. But we are, of course, based, based in Nottingham itself. Uh, for those of you who don't know the UK, Nottingham is about two hours north of London. So everybody knows or roughly has a rough idea where London is. Nottingham is about two hours north of, uh, of London pretty much in the middle of the UK. So for an island, I don't think you can get further away from the coast if you were anywhere else other than Nottingham. The campus itself is based not in the city centre, so it is a, a campus outside the city centre itself and has effectively three separate, or sorry, four separate units. The University Park campus where most of the faculty is based, so engineering, physical sciences, uh, biology, geography, etc., law, is based on the main university campus. And then we have three separate campuses that have slightly smaller schools or departments, but effectively also contribute to the teaching and research environment. So there is a, a small campus called the Jubilee Campus, where our business school is based and where our uh, IT facilities are based. There is a Sutton Bonington Campus, which is a very small little village about 10 miles, 15 kilometers south of, of the main campus, where our veterinary school is based, where plant sciences, life sciences and the veterinary school. And finally, a, a, third, sorry, a third extra campus, the King's Meadow campus, where all our support services are based, the finance, human resources, etc. So that's a little bit about the university. What about the research group? Well, NTEC, as we get known, is the Nottingham Translation Engineering Center. We moved into our facilities probably now about 17, 18 years ago. And this was a very new venture for the university. This was the opportunity for the research group to effectively have their own facilities, which were dedicated to pavement engineering research. So the pictures in this particular slide show a, a brand new building, as it was in 2001, and very similar to what you've got here in, in the University of Costa Rica, very dedicated pavement engineering laboratories in terms of uh, bitumen testing, asphalt testing, uh, and a little bit of pilot scale testing, not quite the HVS standard, but some kind of pilot scale testing. As I mentioned, it's not a new research group. The group actually started in the mid-1950s, um, so we've been going for a good part of 60-odd years. It was initially started by two gentlemen, uh, Professor Peter Powell. So if you look at old papers about fatigue testing of asphalt, you'll see Peter's name in a lot of those papers, uh, and was basically a, a colleague or at least uh, an equivalent to someone like Carl Monosmith at Berkeley. And subsequently, Steve Brown took over that group, and Steve was my boss when I eventually arrived at Nottingham about 25 years ago. Uh, Steve was a geotechnical engineer by, tra by training, but ended up leading the asphalt group and uh, did a lot of work again on developing test methods for, for industry. So very focused in terms of how we would link research at the university to industry. As I mentioned, the group was initially combined with geotechnics, so it was a, a pavement and geotechnics group. And in about 2001, when we had the opportunity to move into those new facilities on the back of a very large research contract through a big oil company, we changed the group to become a dedicated pavement engineering group. And we were called NCPE for about six years, until in about 2007, we decided to broaden the interests of the group to become a, a, a more general transportation group. We've got about 50 people in total, so those will be PhD students, of which there are about 30 postdocs, uh, administrators, a very expert and well-trained group of technicians, and about eight academic colleagues. I'm not proposing to go through and introduce all of them. Uh, obviously, you know my, myself. Andrew Dawson is our geotechnics person, or our unbound grain and materials person. Uh, Alvaro Garcia is the person who's looking at these new self-healing asphalt materials, and uh, obviously Alvaro has very kindly given me some of his material today to talk to you about. Tony Perry is our sustainability person, looking at life cycle assessment. 
Davide Lopresti, who I believe talked at a similar event about a year ago here in Costa Rica, looks after also sustainability, but he's very heavily involved in some of our big networks. So I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, Luis Neves is a, a colleague who's actually in the structures group, but who has a lot of work with us in terms of resilience of our infrastructure, particularly with regard to, to climate change. And finally, uh, Anna and Nick. Anna is a, a postdoc who's working with us and was involved in one of our big uh, consortia and is now working as a postdoc. And Nick Tom is our pavement engineering person, or pavement design person. So how do we organize, or how do we do our research at Nottingham? Well, like any other university, a lot of our research comes through research council funding. So this is government agency funding that comes through in terms of uh, procured research proposals. We do a lot of work for our effective Department of Transport. But in the last 15 years, we've also tried to concentrate on big training networks. Uh, and I want to give you two examples, because I think it's important in terms of understanding our international reach in terms of how we do our research. So the first one, uh, and just a little bit more information, these ITNs, or Innovative Training Networks, are PhD programs where we have not just one university involved, we have probably up to half a dozen universities. So Trust, which was all about looking at uncertainty in, in structural engineering, including our highways and our pavement structures. This was a, a combination of the universities in Dublin, in France, and also in the UK, and a whole range of industrial partners. And so these projects and these training networks allow us to do very fundamental research, but also tap into industry needs and increase our international profile. So we've had students from Costa Rica that have been part of these networks uh, that I come across and actually contributed. So that was TRAS. The second one, which I think is probably more relevant to what we want to talk about in terms of pavement engineering, was something called Super ITN, which was all about sustainability. Sustainability not just in terms of highway materials, but also in terms of railway materials. In the UK, railways, and I guess throughout Europe, are increasingly important. Uh, the UK network, in terms of the railway network, is obviously a very old network, which requires us to do a lot of maintenance work and a lot of that, uh, uh, bringing it up to speed in terms of design and uh, performance. So this was about sustainability, it was about looking at alternative materials, so waste materials, biobinders, uh, rubber, looking at how we would design them to so come up with new design approaches, new testing techniques, new analysis approaches, and then incorporating sustainability. So sustainability is a big key issue for us, definitely in terms of the research we're doing in the UK and in Europe, trying to understand what the long-term effects will be of actually using these materials and how we can address sustainability. So this was done by developing a, a, a program or a bit of software that is now freely available. So if you go and look at Super ITN on the website, that software is available for you to download and to use for your materials, if applicable. So I said I wanted to talk a little bit about where we are in terms of innovation and, and the future research focus for the UK. And probably the easy way to do that is to look at three separate bodies and how they are addressing innovation, how they are addressing the future in terms of where we're going in terms of our highways or transportation systems. And it probably makes sense to start with the organisation that is in charge of looking after our strategic road network. So in the UK, we divide our roads into the strategic road network, which is made up of our motorways and our major trunk roads, so in total of about 4,500 miles. And then the rest of the roads would be defined as secondary roads or local roads, and they will fit into various funding streams. Some of them will be done at a relatively low local level. Some of them would have slightly more strategic importance. But Highways England is the body that looks after the strategic network. Uh, it's a strange organisation because it's not actually a, a government department. It's what we call in the UK a government-owned company. So in other words, it's a private company but instead of having private uh, sector shareholders, the major shareholder is the Minister of Transport. So it's effectively a government-owned company. And they have looked at the road network and they have devised a 30-year program in terms of where they th see that road network developing and, and migrating. And it's all based around the digital road agenda. Very quickly, because I haven't got a lot of time, I'll explain it as best I can what that entails. That entails looking at five different spheres. Design, construction and maintenance, which obviously includes materials. It includes the work that we are doing on uh, self-healing materials and self-healing asphalt. It includes to do things to do with recycling and sustainability in terms of using waste materials, including wrap, including crumb rubber. Uh, 
And then they have a, a big interest in connected and autonomous vehicles. So this is where the UK uh, see the future in terms of our strategic motorway system with having uh, not vehicle driven by people but automated in terms of fleets of heavy vehicles that are effectively channelized going down sections of the motorway. So CAV or connected autonomous vehicles is a big area of research and we do a little bit of that with our colleagues in uh, the satellite group in terms of positioning because obviously these vehicles need to be controlled and very accurately positioned and, and monitored in terms of their movements. Customer mobility, and that's about linking different modes of transport. So in the UK, because it's a small country, we have a, a big need to be able to link our motorway network with our railway network, with other forms of transport in terms of London Underground, to make sure that there is a connected mobile system for the customer and the users. Energy and environment, we've talked a little bit about already, that's to do with sustainability. And then the operations, trying to actually make sure that we use the data that's available. One of the issues that we've discovered is that there is a lot of data out there that is simply not used in terms of trying to understand uh, the transportation of the network. Where are we interested in, or where are we concentrating our interests? We are looking very much at the smart infrastructure aspects, so looking at smart materials, but also looking at the digital interface or the digital infrastructure, trying to get technology that we can monitor or take data from vehicles, for example, and use that data to predict the performance of our motorway system. I think it's important to uh, appreciate that Highways England's main remit in terms of this innovation is based around three pillars, and those pillars are firstly safety, not only safety in terms of their wor workforce on the motorways, but also safety in terms of the customers or the users, so that's a key driver, so a lot of this innovation is directed or, I guess, uh, targeted in terms of safety. The second one is service, providing this new digital road agenda and finally delivery. So that's where highways England are coming from. What about the UK government in general? Well, in general, the UK government has set up a number of what they call catapults, and these will be uh, government agencies that look and, and work very closely with universities, of which the transport systems catapult is the one that directly influences the work that we do at Nottingham. It's a joint venture, so it's government funding, uh, but also research council funding, so UK Research and Innovation, or UKRI, look after some of the input to that particular catapult. And what they've done is they've said, let's look at three enabling activities, so three activities that we feel will influence transportation in the future. So energy and sustainability, we've mentioned those words already. Some form of smart system, again, I've talked a little bit about that. So in the UK, we have things like smart highways that effectively give you real live data in terms of congestion, in terms of traffic speeds, and, uh, and trying to make sure that, that mobility is maintained. And finally, resilience. How do we make sure our assets are not affected by things like climate change or extreme events, extreme weather example? And those three enabling activities are broadly linked to four application areas. So places, places is really about urban development, cities, towns, etc. People and goods, about the customer. Infrastructure, where we're interested. As highway engineers, we're interested, or pavement engineers, we're interested in the infrastructure. And finally, the vehicle. And again, this comes back to your autonomous vehicles. So we are very much concentrating on that infrastructure aspects. So how are we, I guess, tailored our activities at Nottingham in terms of these particular areas? We have divided up our, I guess, our research focus or our research, research themes into four uh, areas or themes, design and performance. This includes materials and includes the pavement engineering and maintenance design practices that we would use in the UK. We look at sustainability, and this could be the softer side of it by looking at uh, using uh, life cycle assessment or life cycle cost analysis techniques to understand our materials, but it could also include using secondary materials in terms of increasing the, the long-term sustainability of our infrastructure. Resilience, we talked about briefly, looking at uh, effects of changes, not only to our climate, but to uh, the external factors that influence our pavements. And then finally, smart systems. So this could be technology, it could be sensors, it could be capturing data from, as I mentioned, vehicles and using that to predict uh, smoothness of ride, rutting resistance, etc.
Again, we've looked at different application areas. Roads are still our key area of research, but increasingly we are looking at work in the railway sector and also increasingly in terms of airfields or airports. And we are looking really at two main areas, materials and technologies, which is really where I do a lot of my research, and then the existing and future infrastructure, so the slightly softer side of what we're going to do in terms of our activities. How does that link into our projects? Well, I mentioned those first two ITNs, those first two train networks. We have just about a third of the way through a latest one, which is called Smarty. Sounds very fancy. It's an ITN that, again, has been set up with a number of partners. So we have partners in, in Spain, in France, in the Netherlands, in, uh, in Ireland, Italy, and looking at trying to map activities based on where we see the future in terms of innovation. So there is a whole aspect of what Smart is going to be doing, looking at sustainability. There's a whole aspect in terms of looking at multifunctional performance. Multifunctional meaning, can we not take our network and instead of just using it to transport vehicles and transport goods, can we use it to potentially uh, harvest energy, for example, or provide some extra facility that will increase its value, its asset value? Uh, automated is to do with that technology of trying to actually get uh, sensors in terms of assessing our material performance and the, the road performance. Resilience I've talked about, and all of these aspects linked to our transport infrastructure. Again, as I mentioned, we're about a third of the way through the four-year program. Uh, there's lots of information. If you go look at Smarty on the internet, Davide Lopresti, who I mentioned earlier on, is the uh, coordinator for our activities in Smarty, and we've got, I think at the moment, five PhD students looking at different aspects of those five different uh, criteria. So that gives you a little bit, hopefully, of a flavor of what we're doing in Nottingham. What I want to do now is I want to concentrate on what started off as a, a, a project directly uh, activated by Highways England because of a concern with moisture damage of uh, a special type of material that was brought to the UK in about 2001, 2002, which was a high modulus material which failed very prematurely on most of our networks. And we were commissioned in terms of doing a very industry-focused research project looking at moisture damage. So I want to look through that. I want to look at a number of different aspects, but I think it's firstly important just to make sure we're all on the same page, just to give you some general definitions of when I talk about moisture damage in asphalt, what am I talking about? Well, we're talking about obviously quite a complicated mode of distress, but we know it has two end effects. It results in a, a reduction in strength of our materials, so our asphalt tends, materials tend to lose strength. It also results in a loss of stiffness, so our materials not only lose their strength in terms of possibly their tensile strength, but they also reduce their, their modulus characteristics. We also know that it's basically driven by two mechanisms. The first one is a loss of this adhesion between the stone and the bitumen, or probably in more reality, the stone and the mastic. And secondly, some form of loss of cohesive strength within the, the binder or the mastic. And we can know, just based on experience, what happens if we actually experience moisture damage, we see two different effects. We either see an acceleration of deterioration, so we see more raveling, more stripping of our materials, or we can increase other mechanisms by making them more severe. So if we have moisture damage on a road that is susceptible to rutting, we tend to find that the rutting occurs a lot earlier in the pavement life. If we have an issue to do with fatigue cracking, again, that moisture damage would accelerate the rate of that in terms of not only the time frames, but also the severity or the degree of, of, of moisture damage. So we set up a framework of trying to understand what were the key drivers in terms of looking at moisture damage. And effectively, we looked at three different areas, material properties, mixture properties, and finally what we call external factors. So the mixture properties or the material properties they are fairly self-explanatory. This is looking at the material comp composition, the components, the stone, the bitumen, and determining their physical as well as their chemical properties. And this is important because although it's a physical phenomenon, inevitably because of the reaction between a stone or an aggregate and bitumen, there is a chemical aspect to what we are looking at. The mixture properties, well, effectively, the two main drivers are binder content, 
And obviously the binder's role is to cover and to coat the aggregate in an asphalt mixture. Increasing the amount of that particular binder obviously will improve the situation. But also looking at the air void distribution or the air void profile of materials to see how we can either limit water getting into our materials by making them relatively dense, or if water does get into that material, how can we connect the void structure so that the water doesn't remain in that particular material. And finally, external factors. And a lot of this was for a research group outside our control, but obviously construction is a big issue. We found from based on, on a large literature review and a survey of typical types of failure in the UK that a lot of the times the materials were actually fine, but when it came to laying the materials in terms of the construction, in terms of the compaction, the densities of those materials, that's where the issues arose. So construction, very important as an external factor. But of course, obviously, the environment is an issue. The UK tends to have a very wet uh, weather pattern. And obviously, there is always going to be lots of access to water. And our traffic levels, particularly on the strategic road network, tend to be very, very high. So you've got the worst of both worlds, a very, very wet environment and very, very high traffic loads. And we looked at a framework where you could combine all three of those particular properties. So material properties, mixture properties, and finally, some idea in terms of controlling the external factors to lead to a performance of our asphalt mixtures in terms of their resistance to moisture damage. Now, there are tests available. There are some tests that I've seen just walking around the labs this afternoon where we can look at measuring or determining moisture damage. So we know that the tests can change in terms of their uh, complex nature, and we can start with relatively simple tests. So tests that we would do, say, on loose aggregate using, say, a coating test, um, still used to a certain degree by contractors to assess their materials in terms of a, a go or no-go scenario. We know that there are lots of tests in terms of compaction of the asphalt mixtures in terms of doing bulk testing. So ASHTO T283 is used universally throughout the world. And so in the UK, we would tend to use a derivative of the ASHTO T283, which is the, the US system. But of course, there are other ways of doing it. Uh, Hamburg wheel tracking, immersion wheel tracking, where we're not only combining the effects of moisture damage by having the environment in a, in a water bath, but we're also combining that with the actual traffic loading. So we know that there are tests available. And there are even tests to do it on a fundamental level. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a second. So using surface energy to measure intrinsic adhesion, in other words, using a theoretical calculation to understand the adhesion between our stone and the bitumen. And then even looking at direct measurements of adhesion. So for example, uh, we saw walking around your lab some examples of the PATI test which is a standard pull-off test used to determine some form of adhesive or cohesive failure of a, an aggregate bitumen system. So there were tests available. We also obviously were aware that one of the key drivers in terms of moisture performance is geared to or a function of the aggregate or the filler type. So although the binder plays its part and we can mitigate some forms of moisture damage by changing something to do with the binder chemistry, or potentially adding a modified binder, in other words, a polymer modified binder. We know that the key driving mechanism in terms of moisture damage is usually linked to the aggregate and increasingly also to the mineral filler. So this was data generated on a test, which I will describe as soon as we get into the bulk material testing that we did, uh, a test that allows us to measure retained stiffness, where retained stiffness, very simply, is a stiffness ratio between a dry material stiffness and the stiffness that material then experiences after it's been moisture damaged. So effectively, it's an it's a, a indication of how much stiffness decrease we've seen for our material. And in this particular test, we can take that retained stiffness, and again, lots of tests do that. ASHTO T2A3 measures the retained strength, but again, you could do a contained stiffness test. But the SATS test allows us to look at different saturation levels. So if you look at the horizontal axis of that particular graph, you can see not only have we got retained stiffness on the y-axis, we've got retained saturation. And retained saturation, very simply, is how much water or moisture there is in the particular material. And so instead of testing at one constant amount of water in terms of our laboratory testing, we can range or we can vary that retained saturation level. And the data presented in this particular slide is for a series of 
asaltic uh, aggregate types, and there was an igneous rock, possibly some form of a granite. And we did a range of different testing using fairly standard high modulus base uh, materials, a low penetration grade bitumen, in other words, a very hard bitumen. And the performance that you can see at the bottom of that slide in the red and the green shows us that as we increase our amount of water in the system from about 40% up to about almost 100% saturation, we see large reductions in terms of retained stiffness. In other words, these materials are really starting to suffer in terms of their performance. However, if we add only about 1% hydrated lime as a replacement filler, in other words, you take out some of the natural filler in that material, so your sub-75 micron material, and replace it with hydrated lime, even down to about 1%, we see a large increase in terms of that retained stiffness. In other words, the material now has the ability to resist that moisture sensitivity. The issue with these tests is that they don't tell you why. They tell you the end result and they say, yes, if you have designed and incorporated the right type of materials into your particular asphalt mixture, you can improve its performance and resist moisture damage. But it doesn't give you the mechanism in terms of what is actually allowing you to improve that performance. And so what we were trying to do in this study was take that data, some of it from the field, some of it from the lab, and now try to understand what is exactly the driving mechanism. And we did this by looking at three stages. The first stage is looking at the fundamental uh, intrinsic adhesion or surface energy characteristics of our materials. So this is work that we started about 12, 13 years ago using some of the concepts that were developed initially at Texas A&M University. So they were looking at about the same time at a very similar approach in terms of using surface energy to measure some form of indirect bonding, if you like, between the bitumen and the stone. It is based on some pretty clever fundamental sciences, so surface energy, which is a property of the materials in terms of their surface reactions. There are different ways of measuring it, and I'm going to show you two techniques that we've used at Nottingham, but there are a range of different ways that we can measure surface energy and get a feel for its properties. There are also different theories. So we looked at a number of different theories. Some of them are very simple in terms of dividing surface energy into two components, a polar component and a non-polar component. We looked at a slightly more sophisticated method called the good finos approach, which divided surface energy into three components, where your polar component was divided into an acid component and a basic component, so a positive charge and a negative charge. And then by using some very clever thermodynamics, and some equations, which I'm not preparing to go into in any great detail, we can come up with a measurement or a calculation of the intrinsic adhesion between the individual components that we're interested in. As I mentioned, there is some clever maths. Uh, the graph on the left-hand side, which shows uh, a solid material with a liquid material reacting with it in an air or a vacuum environment, that effectively allows us to balance the forces that surface energy gives us. So surface energy is a force. We can balance that reaction using the contact angle between the liquid part of that particular combination of three components and your solid component. And then there's some clever mass. I've mentioned two equations there. Young's equation is the equation that we would use to derive that force balance. Dupree's equation is the equation where you would link those relationships between surface energy to some form of work or some force of energy. So this could be a fracture energy, it could be a breaking energy, any kind of energy that allows us to define the reaction between the two materials that we're interested in, in other words, bitumen and uh, aggregate. Again, there is some clever math. I'm going to show you some results later on. Uh, there is lots of information in terms of journal articles and papers that were, wrote, were written both at Nottingham and previously at uh, Texas A&M University. So I said I would mention how we would determine, or how you would go about determining these surface energy properties. And this graph over here shows you that just by using a very simple approach where we can take the overall philosophy that if we have two materials that are sticking together, in other words, two materials that are bonded together, if we know the properties of one of those materials in terms of their actual surface energy properties or surface energy parameters, we can then through some form of matrix calculation or mathematics, we can determine the surface energy 
properties or the surface energy parameters of the unknown material. And so that's the approach that is taken in the main in terms of how you would work out surface energy of a material, whether it's an aggregate or whether it's a bitumen. The way that we've done it is to take two different approaches. So there were five different examples in that previous graph. The way we've done it initially is to take a very simple contact angle approach. And so the first one is used if we want to determine the aggregate surface energy using an approach called a dynamic vapor absorption approach. On the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see that we've got the same schematic that I had previously, where you have a solid material, in this case aggregate, and we are going to bombard it with a liquid, or in the case of the vapor absorption, actually a gas, and get that particular probe liquid or probe gas to completely cover the material. And if we do that, then by definition, we don't actually have a contact angle. In other words, there's no gap or there's no relationship between the probe gas and the aggregate. And if that's the case, your cos theta in your particular equation, because your contact angle is zero, that comes out as one. And therefore, the only thing that you've actually got to measure is some form of pressure. And so your pressure that is being used to force that gas or that probe gas to cover your aggregate is the only unknown in terms of this particular calculation method. If we know what our three uh, components of our probe gas is, then we can, by using a matrix calculation, work out what our aggregate properties are. So I've got a very nice sketch that was actually developed by one of my PhD students just to illustrate how it works. So if we take a sample, let's assume a sample of fine aggregate, or you could have taken a sample of filler, depending on the material that you're interested in. You place it into this vapor absorption equipment, which essentially consists of a very, very accurate microbalance, where we can very, very closely monitor any changes in mass, and effectively a pressure vessel, some means of actually forcing that gas to increase its pressure. And if we then put in a gas, and we would choose a gas with known properties, we would then measure that absorbed mass. In other words, the change in mass as the gas or the gas molecules start to completely cover that particular aggregate sample. So whether it's fine materials or whether it's filler, it's all a function of how long it takes. And eventually you'll get to a point where you get to equilibrium. So you cannot increase the mass anymore at that particular pressure. You then increase that pressure. Let's assume we double it. And in doubling it, we actually activate a lot more of the molecules or force a lot more of the molecules of the gas to try to bond onto that aggregate surface. In other words, to try to cover that aggregate surface. Eventually, that will get to an equilibrium. Depending on how small the particles, it could take a couple of hours. It could be done over a few minutes if it was a slightly larger particle. And then we would do, say, a third pressure. And you would keep on doing this till eventually you end up with what we call an isotherm. In other words, a relationship between mass of increasing of that aggregate particle as it gets covered with molecules of gas as a function of the vapor pressure. There is some clever mass then, and I haven't taken that particular slide in terms of trying to explain it because it takes too long and also becomes too complicated. But if you take that particular relationship between that increase in mass and the partial pressure. If you work out what the actual surface area of your aggregate is, you can work out, if you use three probe liquids, you can work out what the surface energy parameters are. So in other words, you've got three unknowns. You've got a polar component, which is divided into an acid and a base, and you've got a non-polar component. And if you take three probe gases, so in this particular example, we've got three that are gases that we've used one of them always needs to be a pure non-polar material, which allows you to basically solve one of those unknowns. <clears throat> and then you end up with two other probe gases to work out your other two components, your acid component and your base component. And we went through a series of characterizing all the materials used in the UK over a period of about three, four years. So taking all the materials that are available or supplied to us by contractors, subject them to the, the, the DVS test in terms of working out their surface energy parameters. So that's the, how we would do it for the aggregate. How would we do it for the bitumen? Well, slightly different, 
Because now, although we're going to use exactly the same philosophy, we're going to use the approach that I explained earlier on where you have effectively a material and you cover that material with a second material. And in terms of an aggregate, we say we completely covered it and therefore we had no contact angle. With bitumen, <coughs> what we do is we take the bitumen and we do the testing at a low enough temperature so that bitumen is effectively almost a solid. And then we use probe liquids rather than probe gases to effectively see what the reaction is between a liquid and our pseudo-solid bitumen. Because bitumen would have a much lower surface energy than the aggregate, we don't get complete coverage. So we end up where we actually have to measure an angle. The advantage, though, is if we look at exactly the same equation now, <coughs> we don't have any atmospheric pressure. This test is done at room temperature and in a normal atmosphere. So there is no pressure that's been applied in terms of the test. So straight away, your spreading pressure, which was a key criteria for the aggregates, is no longer applicable. And therefore, the only unknown now, if we choose our probe liquids with known energy parameters, is the contact angle. And contact angles are easy to measure. And I'm going to show you two different techniques that we've used at Nottingham. I know that you've got the facilities here at the university to measure at least one of those in terms of working out contact angles. So how do we do it? Well, the first thing we do is we take a, a glass slide and cover it with our bitumen. That's quite easy to do. We can basically heat our bitumen up, place a glass slide into the liquid bitumen, allow that to cool down, and effectively have a solid sample of bitumen coated on the glass slide. And again, as I mentioned earlier on, you would do this at your lowest feasible temperature. Room temperature is possibly going to be applicable if you do the test fairly quickly. But effectively, your bitumen, which is the liquid part of your asphalt mixture, is now acting as the solid. You then place five or three different beakers of probe liquid. Obviously, you've chosen those liquids based on their individual surface energy parameters. And very carefully, using a very, very highly controlled and accurate microbalance, you slowly drop that glass-covered slide into your probe liquid. And what you're going to measure then is the change in effectively weight. It's called a force because obviously we're looking at the force of gravity, but effectively it's looking at how the weight changes as you dip that particular solid bitumen-coated glass slide into your probe liquid. We then can determine some knowns. Obviously, gravity is a known effect. We can actually take that into account. We can also take into account the effect of buoyancy if we know what the geometry of our glass slide is and how much we are dropping it into the probe liquid, if we know the density of that probe liquid, we can work out the effect of buoyancy. And finally, the only thing we don't know is the reaction between the glass slide with the bitumen coated on it and the probe liquid. And that obviously is our reaction between the two surface energy properties of those materials and the adhesion between the two of them. So that test is done using something called a Valhalmi plate method, it's a dynamic contact method. You measure effectively two different uh, angles, an advancing angle and a receding angle, and you can take either of them really if you wanted to actually work out your surface energy. So that's a quite a quick and easy way to measure surface energy, and that's how we do it at Nottingham. There is a second way which we have played around with, and that's using a goniometer. A goniometer, very simply, is a, a very accurate uh, image capturing device which allows you to measure using image analysis, what your contact angle is. So again, if you take your glass slide, cover it in bitumen, and use different probe liquids on top of that solid bitumen glass plate, you can measure different contact angles. And this pretty much ranges. The bottom left-hand uh, diagram shows you the two extremes, I guess, in terms of what you would normally find. Either a very hydrophobic type reaction between a liquid and the bitumen, that tends to occur if you have a very uh, polar liquid. Bitumen tends to be mainly non-polar in nature. If you put a very polar material, such as water, for example, it will definitely form a very high contact angle. And then we get all the way to the other extreme. If we took a very, very uh, non-polar material and put it onto the bitumen, it will actually want to coat the bitumen, and therefore the contact angles will be a lot lower. So using a whole range of different probe liquids, we can get a range of different behaviors. We've used five in this particular case. I think I mentioned earlier on that you need at least three because you're trying to work out three variables. You've got effectively your surface energy divided into 
three components, non-polar, an acid, and a base component, we need to obviously look at at least three probe liquids. We look at five because it allows us to get a much better and more accurate final result. Again, it's worth mentioning, you always need to have a non-polar material because otherwise you can't determine that one parameter. So if we were looking at probe liquids, we would use something called diodomethane, which is a, a non-polar liquid. And then we'd have to have a range of different uh, polar materials. So water, for example, is a good example, um, and various other types, glycerol, uh, ethylene glycol, etc. So what do we get after we've gone through this process? Well, the blue, light blue curves on the left-hand side, unfortunately, haven't come out that accurately on the screen, but you can pretty much get a range or a feel for the results. And the first thing to say is that bitumen doesn't have a massive difference in terms of its surface energy properties from one source to the other. So this was a sample of about 12 different bitumens. The colors were basically linked to bitumens from the same crude oil source, so the light blue turquoise lines were from a Middle East crude where we looked at only differences were their consistency. In other words, uh, in the UK, we use a penetration grade, um, but effectively some form of rheological difference between the binders in terms of a, a soft binder or a hard binder. The red one was a, a Venezuelan crude, and I think the purple ones were from a, a crude oil source um, that was not particularly uh, accepted in terms of UK market, but had been used, say, in the continent. As I said to you before, there are differences, but they're not massive. So you could end up with a, a surface energy value of about 25, and that could range up to about 30. So it's not a massive difference. It is interesting to note, though, if you look on the green four lines on the right-hand side, these were the same binders that we had used in turquoise on the left, but we had added an anti-stripping agent to the actual bitumen. So we've tried to artificially improve the resistance to stripping or to moisture damage of that particular binder by adding an anti-stripping agent at about 0.5%, so not a massive amount of material, using an, uh, an amine system. And straight away you see that you do see an increase in your surface energy. And obviously the higher your surface energy for a bitumen, the better in terms of its desire to bond with stone or aggregate. So that's the bitumen. What about the, the aggregate? The first thing to note is the aggregates are very, very different. So whereas bitumen was effectively giving you very similar values for surface energy, uh, didn't seem to make a massive difference in terms of the final calculation in terms of adhesion. If we look at aggregates, they will differ. And they will differ as a function, firstly, of their uh, mineralogy, and secondly, in terms of their source. So your igneous rocks were very different from your basic rocks. Your igneous sedimentary rocks, again, will be different from your metamorphic rocks. And so this was a range, again, of typical materials used in the UK. So some of those materials will be granite, some of them will be limestones. And again, the higher the value, that tends to be the better the material in terms of adhering or sticking to other materials. We also need to remember that one of the key drivers for adhesion is not just the uh, physicochemical surface energy type adhesion, but also the amount of material interface or surface we have at our disposal. So, one of the things you measure indirectly when you're doing your surface energy measurements using the dynamic vapor absorption is you do get a measure of the surface specific area. And obviously the more surface area an aggregate has, the more area it has to bond with bitumen. And so that needs to be taken into consideration when you look at adhesion. I'm gonna show you a few equations in a second. The other thing to notice is that whereas bitumen tended to be in the majority a non-polar material, in other words, its main component was the non-polar part of those three uh, components or parts of surface energy for bitumen, for an aggregate, each of those components is dominant. And so you will see large variation in terms of the acid component for some aggregates, large variation in terms of the basic components. And this becomes important when we start to look at how we would use thermodynamics to calculate your adhesion between bitumen and stone. So just quickly, so far what we looked at is an approach where we said, let's look at the fundamental behavior or the fundamental parameters that are controlling adhesion that effectively will resist in some form or the other the effect of moisture damage or stripping. And we've looked at two different approaches. We've looked at the bitumen by using a, a Valhalmi plate measuring contact angles and we've looked at 
uh, the aggregate in terms of looking at paper absorption. But those individual values on their own don't really tell us a lot. We now need to come up with a way of combining them. And again, there's some clever maths, which I'm going to show you in a second, where we take the individual components in terms of the surface energy of the bitumen, the surface energy of the aggregate, and we can work out how much bond or how much adhesion we can obtain between those two materials. And the equations that we're going to have, again, I'm not going to spend too much time going through them, but effectively, we have a combination of the polar materials tend to want to stick together. So your acid bases want to stick with acid bases from the second material. So whether it's a bitumen with a stone, it would depend on where the individual components are. Obviously with bitumen, non-polar components are quite significant. But increasingly, obviously with the aggregate, you have to take into account the polar components. And you get a very simple equation for the energy of bond in the dry condition. That equation then becomes a lot more complicated when you introduce water. So, so far what we've talked about is just measuring the properties in terms of surface energy of our two components. Now I'm starting to introduce a third component. And I to say, we've, in our asphalt mixture, we've got our bitumen and we've got our stone. But in terms of moisture damage, we're also now going to add water. And if we add water, and obviously we know what its properties are in terms of its surface energy, we find that we can determine what we would call the wet adhesion, or more correctly, the debonding adhesion, or the debonding energy. Those results on their own, again, would give you some indication. Obviously, a higher debonding energy means that the material is going to be more susceptible to want to be damaged by moisture. And obviously, water, because of its nature, will always want to be more closely bonded with an aggregate than bitumen being bonded to that aggregate. So there's always that driving mechanism, but on its own, it doesn't tell you a lot. So what we've derived is a number of what we call bonding energy ratios. And this is very much the same concept that we used when I showed you the graph of asphalt mixtures where I had a retained stiffness. And I said that retained stiffness was effectively the ratio of the dry stiffness to the wet stiffness. These bond ratios are doing exactly the same thing. They are taking the dry adhesion as a ratio of the wet debonding adhesion. And obviously the higher the value, if you have dry over wet, the better the performance, or at least the better the prediction. So if I took exactly those same materials that I showed you previously, where we had very simple surface energy values for the bitumen and for the stone, and then I showed you a very simple set of equations which allowed us to work out those two adhesion parameters, one the dry, one the wet, we can plot those either in forms of a figure, as I've done in this particular slide, or in of a table. And straight away, we can see that there are massive differences, particularly when it comes to the wet adhesion. So dry adhesion tends to be fairly standard. If you keep everything nice and dry, as you would expect in an asphalt mixture, your performance is going to be very similar. There will be subtle differences in terms of changing the type of binder, changing the aggregate gradation, changing potentially the source of the aggregate. But your performance should be pretty similar. It's when we introduce that water into the component or into the equation that we start to see big differences. So straight away, if you look at the bottom graph, we can see two of those material combinations, the ones in the middle, are giving us extremely high debonding adhesion values. In other words, they are really indicating that thermodynamically, water and aggregate would much rather prefer to be bonded together than the bitumen and the aggregate. And that obviously is a concern. If we're designing a material that needs to be resistant to the effects of water in terms of our asphalt materials, high values of debonding and adhesion or energy are going to give us pretty poor performance. So that would give you at least a starting point. We also, as I mentioned, would want to look at the ratio, those energy ratios. And I talked a little bit originally about the one on the top right hand, sorry, top left hand corner. We can play around with these energy ratios. So although the one on the top left-hand side is a kind of a sensible one, it's got dry adhesive strength or dry adhesive energy divided by the wet debonding energy. We can also play around with the one on the right-hand side, which is saying, well, what happens to the bitumen? Because bitumen has its own cohesive strength. Surely we need to somehow factor that into the equation, because obviously that is going to dominate the behavior if the adhesive failure is taking place, that cohesive strength of the binder is going to have an influence. So the ratio on the top right-hand corner is effectively your dry adhesion between your stone and your bitumen 
minus any kind of cohesive strain which in the bitumen itself. So it's a slightly more severe parameter, again divided by your wet adhesion or your debonding adhesion. And the bottom two equations are introducing what I've talked about previously when I said the thing that we need to always remember is that if we can increase the surface specific area, in other words, the amount of surface area that our aggregates have that allows it to bond with bitumen, that has to be a good thing. So having materials that are relatively rough on terms of their surface area has to be good. And again, we can modify our energy ratios to take that into account by dividing the top two ratios, the top two equations by the specific surface area of our individual aggregate particles. And now we see massive differences. So whereas previously we saw graphs that showed only very subtle differences in terms of the individual parameters, now that we've got to a point where we are physically trying to represent the bonding between aggregate and bitumen in the dry and the wet condition in terms of one parameter, an energy parameter, we can now see that there are big differences between our individual aggregate particles and to a lesser degree, but still some influence in terms of different binders. So if we look at the top left-hand corner, we can see that straight away there are two combinations of aggregate and bitumen that are giving us extremely low values. I don't know whether the values have come up, but anything less than one in terms of that energy ratio is going to straight away indicate that material combination is going to be highly susceptible to moisture damage. Does it actually mean that the material is going to fail? No, because we are obviously still having to have the influence of water entering our pavement structure. So if we keep our pavements nice and dry, have a good waterproofing seal on the surface, make sure the drainage is adequately considered in terms of the design, then we may be able to use that material. But what the graph is telling us is that if we are concerned with water getting into our system, we would want to send or at least select a better combination in terms of those energy ratios. There are differences, obviously, if you look at the top right-hand corner, those ratios change slightly depending, again, on whether we're using uh, ER1 or ER2. And at the bottom two graphs, the effect of surface-specific area, in other words, how much area is available to bond with the bitumen, now starts playing a big difference. So you'll see differences, again, between those graphs simply as a function of how much surface area we've got for our particular aggregates. And we know that some aggregates tend to have much higher surface areas than others, depending on how they are produced in terms of the quarrying process and how they are produced in terms of the crushing processes. So that is important factors. Can we relate these two together? Well, yes, we can. So this is an example of some data using those surface energy parameters where we've got some indication of materials that are nominally good and materials that are nominally bad. And we've measured on the, the y-axis, the vertical axis, some measurement of the asphalt performance in terms of a wet-dry relationship. This is using some form of resilient modulus, so a modulus that was determined dry and wet, and its ratio, and relating that to this energy parameter. So the energy parameters that we used in this particular example were ER4, which was that adhesion minus the cohesive properties of the binder divided by the wet adhesion times by that specific surface area. So that's good. Does it give us all the answers? And the problem was it doesn't. It allows you initially to be very selective in terms of your components. But if you think back to the framework slide that I presented right at the beginning of the moisture damage section, component selection was only part of the equation. We do need to consider how the mixture performs and we also need to consider more than a fundamental level, what the adhesion is. And so there are tests, for example, I mentioned the PATI test. What I want to talk about now is a test that we had developed, which is based not on a put-off test, but a peel test. And so this was work that was done with a group at Imperial College down in London. They're not pavement engineers, they're not civil engineers, they're mechanical engineers, and they are very interested in adhesion in the aeronautical industry. So your fuselage of your plane, is obviously stuck together using some pretty high-level adhesive epoxies. The technology and the testing techniques that we've used to determine our adhesion in our bitumen and aggregate combinations is based on the same tests that are done for those particular components. So the study initially looked at a whole range of different approaches. It included the PATI. So I'm not saying the PATI is not a good test. The PATI has some issues, 
because a pull-off test is always going to be very dependent on the accuracy of the geometry and making sure that your parallel plates in terms of your pull-off are kept parallel. Any kind of twisting or bending moment is going to affect the results. And the patty also has a slight problem in that we cannot accurately control the displacement rate. And so these tests are very much displacement rate dependent. So we looked at different tests. The one on the top right hand corner is something called the tapered double cantilever beam test, a test that does work. The issue with the tempered cantilever test is that you would need to have aggregate substrates replacing these aluminium substrates to allow the test to be performed. And obviously the geometry is restrictive our aggregates don't look like trapezoidal specimens, and therefore that test, although in theory was very good, in practice was not practical. So we looked at the geometry on the bottom. It's a very simple geometry. You're essentially taking uh, three components, an adhesive, in our particular case, bitumen. So in the case of mechanical engineers, it would probably be some kind of epoxy resin. For us as paper engineers, our main adhesive is bitumen. We've got a substrate. Again, if we were mechanical engineers, it would be some form of uh, metallic substrate. Our main substrate is aggregate. And so we need to take a particular sample and convert it into an uh, aggregate substrate. And then we need a third component, which is a mechanism for us to effectively debond that adhesive from that substrate. And we use something called a peel arm. We've tried different types of peel arm. The one that works the best is simply taking an aluminium sheet or aluminium sample and using that as your peel arm. So in theory, very easy approach. In practice, probably not quite as easy. I'm gonna go through the next uh, 15 to 20 slides and show you how we've managed to eventually produce a test that is probably now close enough to become standardized in the UK in terms of an adhesion test. The very first thing to do is to obtain your aggregate substrates. And straight away, this is an issue because our stones that we use in our asphalt mixtures are not the correct size to allow us to produce a geometry for a peel test. A peel test requires you to have a substrate of at least 200 millimeters in one dimension. So effectively, our aggregates that we would use, even if we're using very coarse aggregates, are gonna be nominally 40 millimeters at the most. So the process that we've used was to obtain boulders, effectively from the same quarry that we would produce in terms of our asphalt aggregates, we would obtain boulders that were used or produced before they were crushed into the aggregate. We would go through quite a complicated regime in terms of cutting and sawing to make sure that we ended up then at the bottom of that particular slide with effectively cubes of nicely positioned substrate aggregates. So dimensions were roughly 200 millimeters in terms of the longest dimension, 20 millimeters in terms of the cross-sectional area, the thickness does vary. The thickness will depend to a certain degree on how strong your aggregate particles are. So if you've got a very strong aggregate particle, you can probably cut it down to about 10 or 15 millimeters. If you had a material that was very susceptible to fracture, you obviously would need to get a slightly thicker specimen. But effectively, the controlling geometry is that length of 200 millimeters and your width of 20 millimeters. And so the bottom two diagrams, one of those is a, an igneous rock, some form of granite, and the other one is a limestone. And you can see straight away we can produce a whole range of different types of aggregate substrates. The important thing, though, is to make sure that we haven't changed everything in terms of what we would have in an asphalt mixture. And so we were very keen to find out what was the surface texture, what was the surface profile of those particular substrates compared to a normal aggregate. And we can do that with a number of different techniques. The first technique is to use something called a profilometer, where effectively you very accurately measure the surface roughness of your individual particles. And I'll show you a few examples, a few diagrams of what we found. The other approach is to look at X-ray diffraction. If we are interested to make sure that the crystalline structure or the crystal orientation of our minerals in our aggregate were effectively exactly the same as what you'd find in a normal crushed aggregate, we would have to do some kind of X-ray diffraction. And again, this was done because there's always a concern when you produce a, a laboratory test that you may potentially be artificially changing reality in terms of how the materials perform when they're in an asphalt mixture. So profilometer, X-ray diffraction on the materials, and a few examples. So we looked here at 
obviously the crushed aggregate that we would obtain from a normal asphalt plant. We looked at our substrates and we looked at two different conditions of our substrates. Some of them were simply cut and then tested. Some of them were polished, polished using some form of uh, sandblasting. And we were very interested to see how much difference there was in terms of the surface roughness or the surface profile. And there are differences. You can see on the right-hand side, the slides haven't come out that well, but there are differences. But to a certain degree, those differences tended to be on quite a large wavelength. So if we were only looking at very, very small changes in the profile, we weren't that dissimilar. So although we weren't obviously trying to replicate exactly what we would find in an aggregate that was used in asphalt mixture, in terms of localized profile or localized roughness, we were fairly happy that if we use a robust storing process, we could produce these substrates that were very similar in terms of the surface profile of a normal aggregate used in the asphalt mixture. We also were very interested in this surface area. Remember I've mentioned at least two occasions so far, surface specific area is an important component of adhesion. Obviously the bigger the surface area you've got for your bitumen to bond with the stone, the better. And so again, we were very interested or very concerned to make sure that when we produce these substrates, we weren't artificially changing the surface specific area of our aggregates. And so what we ended up doing is producing a range of, some of them artificial, but some of them are real aggregates that have been crushed in a plant and produced for asphalt. They're all nominally the same size, so they all were roughly about uh, one millimeter square in terms of their cross section. And then we measured their surface specific area using the same dynamic vapor absorption technique that we use when we measured surface energy. There are differences, uh, and this is obviously a concern with this test because this becomes extremely difficult to mitigate against in terms of trying to understand the behavior. If you looked at your crushed aggregate, we're getting about a value which is about 10 times higher than if we looked at those cubes that have been, or the blocks that have been produced using the cutting technique. And we looked at two different cutting techniques. We looked at a normal uh, diamond edge saw, and we also looked at water jet cutting. They gave you very similar results. There's not much difference between those two, but it's important to realize that there is a factor of about 10. So although the profile wasn't different, the specific area is a factor. Now, is this going to be important for this particular test? Yes. Are we overly concerned? Probably not, because if we're going to do it as a comparative test in terms of adhesion properties for a range of different materials, if we are producing all the materials in the same manner, we are simply just affecting up a rating or a ranking system. And therefore, although we're probably not re representing the actual adhesion in the material in terms of the asphalt, we are at least able to rank the materials. And finally, we're very interested in being able to link mineralogy back to adhesion. So although we could do the test and we could end up with different ranges of results, without understanding exactly what the mineral composition of our aggregate were, we're not going to get a nice relationship or at least some kind of information that we can use as a screening tool. So all the aggregates that were tested, all the substrate plates that were made, all went through some form of a mineral liberation analyzer, or MLA, which is basically a, a scanning electron microscope with a special at attachment, uh, where we can define or at least separate our individual mineral composition. And I've given you three examples there. The one on the left-hand side is a normal limestone. As you would expect, mainly calcium carbonate in nature. That's the dominant mi mi uh, mineral or material. Probably 99% of the actual material made up of that particular component. The one in the middle and the one on the right-hand side are two very different granite aggregates or igneous rocks. One of them works from experience extremely well in the field in terms of resisting moisture damage. So this is field data that will allow us to indicate this material, if it's produced correctly, will be able to resist moisture damage. The other one is highly susceptible to moisture damage. And there are, as you can see, quite large differences in terms of their mineralogy. So although they're both classified in the UK as granites, they are effectively two different materials. And that's important for us once we start looking at the, the results and trying to analyze what the results mean. So how do we go about producing specimens for the peel test? Well, it's a very simple approach. All right? This was obviously uh, a, a development stage proposal or, or project. This was the final outcome in terms of how we defined 
or how we produce these pill specimens. You take your substrate, your aggregate substrates, and you very, very carefully pour hot bitumen onto that particular substrate, making sure you control the thickness of that bitumen adhesive layer by using copper wire. So the copper wire has a very, very well-defined thickness. So this will be standard gauge copper wire. We could change the thickness from 100 microns to 150 microns to 200 microns, depending on what we were looking at. But very accurately, using those as almost uh, gauges, we can very accurately define the thickness of our adhesive layer. Once you've done that, you very carefully place your peel arm. And your peel arm, as I mentioned earlier on, will be some form of aluminium strip. And we can play around with the dimensions and the thickness of that strip, and I'll show you some examples of results we've got in a second. But basically, make sure your aluminium strip sticks to your adhesive bitumen, cool down the entire system, and then you are ready for testing. And the testing is done by very accurately peeling off, off that aluminium top plate. And we use a 90 degree peel test. So although the peel test can be done at any angle you like, if you use 90 degrees, then your displacement rate in the vertical plane is exactly the same as your displacement rate in the horizontal plane. It makes the calculations and the mass a lot easier to work out your displacement rate and how you work out your fracture energies. So 90 degree peel arm, there are testing issues, but again, once you've actually solved that, it's a lot easier and a lot cleaner in terms of the mathematics. And then straight away you start getting values in terms of initially a load. So if you're doing a constant displacement test, and all these tests for this particular example were done at 10 millimeters per minute, <clears throat> we would peel off that particular aluminium peel arm off our substrate and bitumen combination, and we would measure a load. So this was uh, a relatively soft binder. The 85 refers to the penetration grade, so this is a soft binder that you would probably want to be using possibly as a surfacing binder in a surfacing material. And you get values and it varies slightly, about 20 newtons as your, your force required to peel off that particular combination. We could play around with that, and we did. So this is 15 pen. This is a very, very hard binder. So this is a binder that you would typically use if you were producing a high modulus asphalt material, a major, major structural asphalt layer in your road. So 15 pen binder, again using exactly the same displacement rate of 10 millimeters per minute, and again measuring the load. And the first thing to notice is that we now see that there are discontinuities in the actual results. And this is the effect of what we call uh, crack jumping. It's an effect that you see in terms of mechanical engineering when you use epoxy resins as well. It's when the material actually is, is stiffer than what it is or what it should be in terms of being able to carry that load in terms of its propagation. It's not a problem because you can still get an average force and therefore an average fracture strength for that material. But I'm going to show you in a second how we can use time, temperature, superposition to actually reduce the variability or at least those errors in terms of that crack jumping by changing the displacement rate. So displacement rate is one of the parameters, obviously temperature is the other. And I said we would also play around by changing your aluminium peel arm thickness. So the equations that are used for the peel test are based on uh, a plastic analysis or an elastic analysis depending on which approach you take. They give very similar results if everything is the same. But one of the factors that actually influences those analysis is how thick your aluminium peel arm is. And so we looked at three different peel arms or three different sheets of aluminium, 150 microns, 200 microns, and then a, a much thicker 400 microns. And the first thing to notice is that although the failure mechanism, and you can see the failure mechanism because you, what you would do is once you've peeled off your aluminium peel arm, you can see where the failure has occurred. It's either occurred within the bitumen itself, in other words, it's a cohesive failure, or it's occurred at the interface between the aggregate substrate and the bitumen, which is a more adhesive failure. So the failure mechanism is exactly the same. That doesn't change. What tends to change is the actual values in terms of your fracture strength or your force to cause failure. And that graph just quickly summarizes, I don't want to dwell too long on the individual uh, results, but if you look at the, the bottom table first, I've got my three peel arms, 150 microns, 200 and 400. The 150 and the 200 gave you roughly the same kind of energy, so about 900 joules per meter squared. And that kind of indicates to us that those are the kind of thicknesses where the influence of the thickness of the aluminum plate is not going to be a factor. 
The 400 shows a massive difference. And what we found is that as you get thicker and thicker, you tended to actually spend a lot of the energy in actually peeling that aluminum plate and not actually measuring the binder with adhesive. And so your fracture energies have dropped down to about 500. So all the testing I'm going to show you from now onwards will be done with the 200 micron aluminum plate thickness. Just quickly, the top graph shows you those uh, different types of uh, softness or hardness of bitumen. I've showed you the 15 pen and the 85 pen. We also did a 50 pen. There are subtle differences. What tends to be the, the norm is that the stiffer the material, the higher its cohesive strength. And if failure is cohesive in nature, you will find that your harder binders will tend to give you a higher cohesive strength and therefore a higher peel strength. So that's only half the story, though, because that's only trying to understand adhesion in terms of the dry condition. We talked right at the beginning about the fact that we are really talking about moisture damage, and therefore exactly the same as when we use the surface energy and intrinsic adhesion calculations where we had to have a dry versus a wet, we've got to do exactly the same thing for the peel arm. And that causes us a problem, because that's not straightforward. So we tried a number of different techniques. I'm going to explain three of them here. The first one was to do the entire test inside a water bath, or at least some kind of uh, perspex chamber that allowed you to test the specimen in a moist environment. How does it work? Well, very simply, you take exactly the same geometry that you produced for the dry specimen. You will get a series of results, and the repeatability of this test is, it's all right, it's not great, but it's not too bad. We would then do a series of the exactly the same specimen, but this time testing it underwater. And that would usually involve leaving the geometry underwater for anywhere up to two weeks at a time, and then doing the peel test. There are effects, and I'll show you some of the results in a second. There are effects in that potentially the longer you leave it in water, the more the bond between the aggregate and the bitumen would start to fail. You start to get your effects of adhesive failure and stripping and moisture damage. And also the values of your fracture strength tend to change as well. As you move from a cohesive type failure in the bitumen to an adhesive failure at the interface, you see a reduction in fracture strength. That was the one way of doing it. It was mildly successful, but what we've ended up doing it is two other ways. This is what we call pre-bonding and post-bonding. And there is a subtle difference. The first three slides on the top show something called the pre-bonding treatment. And that involved taking our aggregate substrates, in other words, our different aggregate particles, different aggregate specimens, and soaking them for different periods of time in water. So placing them inside a water bath anywhere from six hours for, in terms of short-term preconditioning all the way up to about two weeks, possibly even up to four weeks. The idea is that you have allowed water to enter that aggregate. And once you've surface dried the top of that aggregate substrate to allow you to prepare your specimen, you will have access, in terms of water that is still inside the aggregate, to diffuse to the interface. And we can look at the results in a second to show how successful that particular approach was. So that's the pre-bonding moisture conditioning uh, protocol that we developed. The second bottom, or the second uh, process, which is the bottom three slides, is a post-bonding treatment. So this time, instead of actually soaking our substrate in water, we prepare our specimens exactly the same way as we would if we were using a dry test. So place your aggregate substrate, pour your bitumen on top, place your element peel arm, and have it ready for testing. And now we place that particular geometry in its entirety into the water bath, again for different periods of time. So six hours is probably the shortest, maybe three hours, anywhere up to two weeks or up to four weeks if we wanted to go for long term. The approach there, or at least the philosophy of that particular moisture conditioning regime, is that moisture now diffuses either through your individual components, so mainly through the aggregate, or it can diffuse along that interface, that bond between your aggregate and your bitumen. So there are subtle differences between pre- and post-bonding. So let's look at a few of the results. Obviously, the very first thing we would have to do is determine a dry strength. It could be a cohesive strength, it could be an adhesive strength. In the main, most of our materials, in there, if they're dry, will fail cohesively. They will fail within your bitumen bonding. And so this particular example, let's not worry too much about what the material was. 
This gave us a strength of about, or at least a load of about 30 newtons in terms of our peel strength or peel arm test. If we look at the next set of figures, we've got it after six hours in the uh, water bath, where we now see the reduction in terms of that peel load has dropped from 30 down to about 13, 13, 12 newtons. So more than half the value of the six hours. What is interesting, though, is that the failure mechanism hasn't changed. It's still primarily a cohesive failure. So what's happening is your, your bitumen effectively is losing strength rather than a change of the failure mechanism from the bitumen to the interface. But if we look at the next extreme, if we look what happens after seven days, we now find that the actual load in terms of our peel test has dropped down to two newtons of the top figure. I've included the bottom figure just to show that there is quite a lot of variability now. As you start to damage your specimens, inevitably some will perform better than others. But again, there were portions of that bottom specimen that also had dropped down to about four newtons. But I think more importantly, we now start to see the influence of moisture damage, that change in failure mechanism from a cohesive failure in your dry specimen, where everything is sticking nicely together in terms of the bitumen and the stone, to some form of debonding or stripping. In other words, some form of adhesive failure. So straight away, this test is allowing us to not only determine a value in terms of the fracture strength, but also to identify the actual mechanism of failure. And that's quite important in terms of understanding the combinations of different aggregates and different bitumens in terms of our materials. So very quickly, I'm not going to again go through all these values in great detail, but the top three results correspond to a dry specimen. Uh, they're the ones that we played around with the aluminium peel arm. And remember I said we're going to use 200 microns as a standard. So the value is roughly for the top half of that particular graph, about 1,500 uh, newtons per meter, or if you look at the fracture energy, about 100, sorry, about, about 350, 330. And then the bottom seven results correspond to our moisture conditioned behavior, where, as I mentioned earlier, we might have a relatively short amount of moisture conditioning for six hours in a water bath, all the way through to about two weeks or 14 days. And again, we're now starting to see, not only can we see a reduction in our fracture strength, in other words, this the start of moisture damage or peeling or stripping of our material, but also we have the ability to identify the exact failure mechanism in terms of the location of that particular failure. So it's moving from a cohesive type failure within the adhesive or the bitumen all the way down to uh, an interface failure between the aggregate and the uh, bitumen. I also mentioned that we would obviously want to test a whole range of different binders, and I showed you two examples, a, a very soft binder, which gave us relatively repeatable results, and then I showed you a very hard binder, which tended to show uh, a few uh, errors in terms of crack jumping because the material was actually too stiff. This is exactly the same binder now, so it's that 15-pen binder, and what we've done is we've just reduced our displacement rate which was 10 millimeters per minute down to two millimeters per minute. And using time temperature superposition, we've said, well, we're gonna test slower. The material obviously has a lower stiffness or lower modulus, it behaves as a softer material, and therefore we can get a much more representative result in terms of our peel strength or peel force. So that's the result of the dry specimen. Again, we can go through the same procedure that we've done previously. This is using the pre-bonding condition where again we have pre-bonded our, our substrates in water to allow water to diffuse into the aggregate. Do the test, obviously, after it's been moisture conditioned, and we see a reduction from about 30 down to about 16. And finally, if we go to the whole seven-day pre-bonded conditioning, we're down to about three newtons for the first specimen, and a bit of variability in the bottom specimen, again down to 10. That just summarizes the results for bitumens. We know already that the bitumen is not the dominant factor. We know that behavior tends to be dominated in terms of moisture damage by the type of aggregate that we're using. But this just illustrates that if we had exactly the same type of aggregate and we played around with the bitumen, we do see subtle differences. So the softer binders would tend to perform slightly different to the harder binders. But in general, we're seeing roughly the same two or three days of moisture conditioning is giving you about a 50% reduction in your fracture strength in terms of the peel test. But obviously we were very interested in using this test to differentiate between different types of aggregate. And the first thing to remember 
is that these aggregates have different water diffusion rates. In other words, water moves through them and potentially then is available at the interface between the stone and the bitumen at different rates. And so the first thing we did was that we actually determined what that diffusion rate was for the range of materials that we're interested in. This is just three examples. I've got two different types of aggregate there uh, in terms of basic materials. One is the limestone and two of them are granites. And the two granites which are labeled AR, AE and AF have different diffusion rates. So although they were nominally the same in terms of their mineralogy and in terms of their chemical composition and in terms of their nature, they were very different in terms of their moisture diffusion. And can we see the effect of that in terms of results? Well, yes, we can. So what I'm going to show you now very briefly, just to finish off this section on the adhesion test, is those two aggregates that were effectively the same mineralogy but with different diffusion rates, AE tends to be the one that has a slightly higher diffusion rate. So it went from 13 down to 3 after three days conditioning, and AF tended to have a much lower diffusion rate. It went from nominally again 13, it was slightly higher this time, about 14 newtons, but in terms in, of fracture strength, not that much difference once you've done the calculations. And because water now is not going to be able to diffuse as readily to the interface, we see that the behavior has only dropped down to about five. So not only does the test allow you to understand the basic mineralogy of the aggregates in terms of ranking their performance, it also allows you to look at the effect of this water diffusion rate, which is important. Just quickly to summarize then, again, those are the three aggregates that I showed you. If you, again, if you look at the AR, AF, and AA, AR, AE, that's where you see the differences in terms of moisture damage, not because of the different mineralogies, but simply because they actually allow water to diffuse through them <laughs> at very, very different rates. So the last thing we wanted to do then was to link the bulk properties. So, so far we've looked at surface energy, we've looked at intrinsic adhesion, we've looked at a practical way of measuring adhesion. And I did mention obviously there are other techniques, we talked about the patty, but the peel test tended to give us very reliable, very repeatable, and very useful results that we actually then could correlate with particular materials in the field. So what about the asphalt measure itself? And in this particular case, we have used a test that was developed in Nottingham, which is a combined aging moisture damage test. So it's a test that is effectively looking at two mechanisms in one. And we've done that because that's what happens in a road. Obviously, the road is experiencing <coughs> oxidation throughout its lifetime in terms of the bitumen reacting with oxygen, becoming harder or brittle potentially. But once you've introduced water into the equation, you obviously also have to have an effect of moisture damage and potentially stripping or debonding. And this test effectively allows you to take your asphalt specimens and do both types of distress simultaneously. So how does it work? Well, very simply, you take five specimens. So these could be specimens that were taken from uh, a proper road job. These could be cores taken out on the road, 100 millimeters in diameter, about 60 millimeters in height. So very much like a marsh or asphalt specimen. Or we could make them in the lab. We could use a gyratory compactor and produce specimens, usually using a 150 millimeter geometry and then coring out the internal 100 millimeters. Or we could make a slab and core out slabs to produce those five individual specimens. We then place those different specimens into that particular loading frame. So that loading frame allows us to place inside a pressure vessel four specimens above a water reservoir. So at the bottom of that particular pressure vessel, we place a small amount of water and allow one of those specimens to be submerged. So what we've got now is four specimens above the water line, one directly inside the water bath. And then we apply pressure, and the pressure is quite high. It's about uh, 20 atmospheres, so very similar to what you would use when you're doing your pressure aging on your binders with the PAV and allows us to obviously increase the temperature. So we've got two mechanisms, a pressure and a temperature mechanism, reacting to that particular set of specimens. We would initially saturate them. So you do exactly the same kind of protocol that you would if you were doing the ASHTO T283. You do some kind of vacuum saturation. And on the left-hand side, I've given you examples. We would get roughly the same saturation. It will vary, but let's assume we've managed to produce five specimens with roughly 55% uh, saturation level. The test then 
artificially form some kind of environment where water is circulating. And that water is circulating by evaporating from the surface of that reservoir at the bottom and condensing on the top of my pressure vessel and then effectively dripping down. And we know that because if you take those specimens out and measure their water content, in other words, you work out what their saturation levels are, you end up with five different saturation levels. The one under the water obviously is the highest, and that could range. This particular example, it got up to about 80%. Some of them go up towards 100%. It depends very much on the internal void structure. But then you find your four specimens above your reservoir give you a whole range of different values. Some of them could be quite dry. So this particular one at the bottom there gave us about 6% water content or 6% saturation. The one at the top about 66. You then do your testing, the same kind of testing that we talked about before. We measure a dry stiffness before we do the conditioning and then a wet stiffness. You work out your retained stiffness ratio and you now can plot the results as a function of the individual saturation in that specimen. And so obviously the submerged one in this particular case is just over 100%. There's obviously some area in terms of expansion of the specimen potentially, but say 100% saturation, and that would tend to give you the lowest value, but you end up with a range of different values. And that's extremely useful if we start looking at big data sets. Because you now I can see we're not going to get one result, we're going to get a whole range of different results. And in potential links to field performance, we can start to relate the saturation levels to what we would experience in the field. And so the top two diagrams, the one on the left is using an igneous rock, some, some kind of acidic granite type aggregate, and four different types of binder. The one on the right hand side is the same range of different binders, but this time using a, a basic aggregate, a limestone type aggregate, sedimentary aggregate. We can see differences there. The bottom left hand corner is the very first graph I showed you when we started talking about moisture damage, how we could change just very small components such as the filler by replacing it with hydrated lime and see the effects of improved moisture damage resistance. And the one on the right hand side is looking at the volumetrics. We talked a little bit about that in terms of the mixture properties, increasing the binder content to give you a slightly thicker binder film or more coverage of your aggregates and potentially also playing around with the void content. So this test is extremely useful. How do these results link to what we've done in those previous two sections? Well, the link is actually quite good. If I put all the little graphs up here, we've got a range of different types of performance based on the sats retained stiffness. So these are asphalt mixtures. This was actually field material. This was material that was called out of particular road sections. And we've got different types of behavior. We've got very good behavior on the right-hand side, which correlates really nicely with the thermodynamic predicted intrinsic adhesion results and those energy ratios. We've got very, very poor behavior on that bottom left-hand quadrant where the SATS results and field performance is indicating poor performance and we're getting very, very low energy ratios from our thermodynamic surface energy calculations. As with any real set of data, there is an outlier. There is an outlier that says quite clearly that the test is indicating that this material is poor. Its field performance indicates it's poor. Its surface energy, intrinsic adhesion, and thermodynamic calculations indicate that it's actually not bad. And so I'm not proposing that any one of these tests in isolation is going to give you the solution. It's how we use them as particular tools at our disposal to look at our material. So whether we go from a very fundamental approach, looking at surface energy, looking at intrinsic adhesion, looking at your energy ratios, or where you develop a test such as the peel test or the PATI, any kind of test that's directly measuring fracture strength or fracture energy in a dry and wet condition, or whether you go through to your full asphalt mixtures. I think we've got time. I'm having a quick look to the right. So what I want to do now is I want to talk a little bit about the stuff that we're doing, which is quite new. It's stuff that's been doing, done by my colleague, Alvaro Garcia. It's looking at trying to manufacture or at least manipulate the typical type self-healing ability of asphalt materials by giving it a helping hand. And we're looking at two different approaches. So what do we know about self-healing? Well, self-healing is not a new phenomenon. Self-healing is around us all the time. It's evidence in nature. I mean, your particular body self-heals all the time. And all we're trying to do now is take a material that is generically self-healing in nature because of the fact that bitumen is a, a fluid, it's a viscoelastic fluid, it will flow, it will heal itself, and trying to use that and use various techniques using other fields to try to mimic that 
producing self-asphalt or self-healing asphalt. So self-healing materials are all around us all the time, particularly in other spheres of the construction industry, so polymers, concretes, metals, and the techniques that have been used, so using a vascular system where you're effectively having uh, connected channels within your material which allows you to put in healing materials or get healing materials to flow to areas of weakness, or using uh, memory polymers, or using capsules, or other techniques such as bacterial growth, all these approaches are fairly standardized in industries outside the road industry. And what we've been doing in the last three or four years is saying, can we not take some of these concepts, approaches, and help our materials to potentially become self-diagnosing and self-healing? So the first approach that we're going to take is trying to understand what actually happens to our roads. And the behavior is fairly standard. Whether we take any kind of performance criteria, some form of riding quality, or it could be cracking density, it could be rutting potential. We know that our roads go through a stage where they start to deteriorate with time. Time being traffic loading, time being environmental conditioning, time being any factor that is effectively causing our damage to our material. So it could be cracking, it could be rutting, it could be long-term de degradation, and eventually it will occur with failure. So ingress of adhesive or aggressive substances, potential failure of our road. And so what we're going to look at is can we take an approach where we can improve that decline in terms of performance? Well, there are standard ways of doing it. We can obviously build thicker pavements, obviously more expensive, but potentially would give you a much higher starting point in terms of your performance deterioration graph. We can even add such things like uh, grids, geofabrics, any form of reinforcement to our asphalt materials that again will give it a potentially higher starting point and give it a much longer life to deterioration or loss of performance. But these are expensive options. So what we've looked at is saying, well, let's not change the actual initial behavior or the initial performance level. Let's just allow the material to get to a particular degree of degradation or damage and then effectively heal itself and try to get back to maybe not its starting point, but at least get back to something that's better than what it was when it got to the point where it was deteriorating. And that's the approach that we've looked at in terms of our self-healing pavements or self-healing asphalts. We know that asphalt heals on its own anyway. So this is the experiment that we did right at the beginning. We took a, a, a specimen, a cylindrical specimen, we notched it, and we effectively did a, a three-point bend test to fail the specimen in terms of complete fracture. We then placed the particular failed specimen back into a mold, so those two failed interfaces were together, placed it in a 60 degree C controlled environment, and then periodically looked at what's happening with that particular fracture or that particular crack. So after five hours, not much, or after five minutes, not much, 10 minutes, we're starting to see something, 15, 20, 25, we're now seeing quite a lot of that crack or that fracture has actually disappeared. 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes. And by the time we got to 50 minutes, we could effectively take that specimen back out of its particular uh, mold or chamber, place it back onto that three-point bending test, and repeat the test and get another value. So we know that bitumen and asphalt already has that capability. Obviously, our roads are not at 60 degrees C. So we had to look at approaches that would effectively help that particular phenomenon or speed it up. And so we've looked at two approaches. The first one is using induction heating, so some kind of magnetic field, and using the fact that if we put in materials that are going to react with that change in magnetic field in terms of induction, we can locally heat our material quite high and allow it to actually heat. So how does it work? Well, it works only if we have an induction material or a material that actually can be heated by using the induction heaters. So any kind of metallic material preferably some kind of waste material rather than something that we've actually had to manufacture, if we can place it inside our asphalt material, inside the bitumen or inside the mastic, we can locally heat it and we can use exactly the same phenomena that the bitumen already has to self-heal. So apply some form of uh, induction heating and effectively allow that crack or that uh, area of weakness to effectively close up. What kind of materials will we use? Well, as I said, any kind of material that is effectively going to be 
activated by using the induction heating approach. So we could use steel grit, we could even use steel wool, some kind of uh, recycled fibers from car tires could be useful, or metal shavings. And we played around with all of these. Some of them are quite expensive and therefore probably not that practical. Some of them are already waste materials and don't add a massive amount to our final product. The ones that we've looked at potentially, we'll just quickly to show you some, I guess some differences in terms of these individual materials. Some of them spread out really nicely. So on the left hand side, we've got the metal shavings. They can actually be added and distributed in the asphalt mixtures just by adding them during the simple mixing process. So where you're adding your aggregate and mixing it and then adding your bitumen, if you add in your metal shavings just before you add the bitumen, you get a fairly uniform dispersion. The fibers from car tires tended to cluster and tended to bulk up in terms of little balls of fibers. Uh, obviously, there's potential for that to be heated, and it may be beneficial, but in terms of spreading that actual effect throughout the asphalt mixture, that's probably not what you were looking for in terms of that bulking up. So the study that we've looked at, or the research that's been done over the last two years, has really concentrated on using steel wool, which is quite easy to distribute within an asphalt mixture. We can actually produce specimens. We've got a, a little localized induction heating coil, and there's a bit of science in terms of defining the actual parameters of that coil, but once those have been defined, it's a fairly easy technique to produce specimens and then subject them to some form of induction heating, induction healing using the coil. It's localized heating, so you're not effectively heating up your whole specimen, which is what you would have if you had some kind of infrared heating approach. With the induction heating, you're only heating up the metallic sections, which are usually associated with the bitumen. And then you're going through a process. And the process is very simple to, to illustrate through these next few slides. You've got your steel fibers. You apply your induction heating. It locally heats up your bitumen or your mastic. It expands and it very, very close, very quickly closes up that particular crack and either reduces it completely or reduces it to a degree where effectively you can retain some of your initial strength or your initial stiffness. How do we quantify that? Well, we quantify it again with that very simple three-point bending test that I talked about at the beginning. You have your specimen. You obviously apply some kind of initial load to work out its initial uh, pre-damaged strength. You then give it a value F1. You put that specimen through the induction heating process. You test it again using your three-point bending approach to get another fracture strength, call that FF, and you determine that healing ratio. How successful is it? It does vary. The test also can vary. We could also use a very simple geometry, such as the semicircular bending test. So the semicircular specimen is very easy to manufacture could be a core from a road or it could be a, a sample made in the directory compactor. Cut it in half, notch it, do the test, damage the specimen in terms of fracture, put it under induction heating and obviously reheal it and retest it. What do the results look like? Well, the results look extremely promising. There is a threshold. Induction heating does require you to actually exceed some form of minimum temperature. That will vary depending on how much of the steel wool or steel fibers you put into the material. But for this particular set, we were looking at about 0.1% by mass. We would have to get above but roughly 50% before we saw any effect. And once you've done that, you can get a whole range of different healing ratios. The healing ratios go up to as high as about 75%. So this is not a complete healing. We're not able to restore the properties to what they were initially but we're able to get them back to at least 75% of their starting point. The two sets of data there, the red unfilled circles are the measured data, and then we've done some uh, statistical filtering of the data to give you your black curves or your black uh, circles. And if we look at individual particles, so these were particles that were, sorry, these were specimens that were put under the X-ray CT the scanner looking at their uh, void content, which was effectively in terms of damage. So these were not fracture tests. This was basically just damaging these specimens to some kind of uh, completed or, or repetitive load, and then looking at the change once we've done the induction heating in terms of the void content. And there are significant differences. There is significant healing taking place. So how close are we to reality in terms of using this technology? Well, a lot closer than what we initially thought we would be when we started the research three years ago. At the moment, 
there is a full-scale European project looking at using induction heating in the field. So this is a study that's been done partly through the University of Nottingham, but also through a number of contractors in the Netherlands and in France. And the machine that's available is a mobile machine, so it can go out on the road. It can actually go over sections that have, obviously, some form of steel fiber or steel wool in their actual matrix and provide induction heating to effectively self-heal the material. And so that study is ongoing. It finishes sometime next year, and that will be uh, available in terms of giving a practical uh, report or in terms of assessment of how feasible induction heating is. So, very quickly then, the last technology I want to look at is using encapsulation. In other words, saying, well, what happens if we add, at the beginning of when we're producing our specimens, some form of capsule that when it, it is damaged in terms of the asphalt, that capsule will release some form of healing agent. So, so again, it's not new technology. It's technology used in other fields in terms of construction materials. But obviously, for bitumen or for asphalt, it has to have certain criteria. So the first thing is it has to be able to release whatever that healing agent is at the correct time. And that can be done through a number of different processes. At the moment, we're looking at two different processes. Either there is some kind of mechanical unlocking of that capsule in terms of when damage occurs at a certain level, the capsule cannot uh, maintain its integrity, it breaks and it releases the fluid into the asphalt material which allows it to heal. Or we can have it activated by a change in the outside coating of the capsule when it is subjected to moisture. In other words, the philosophy there is once the roads start to fail, water will get into that road in some particular form. Once it actually hits the, the capsule is, it will reactivate the capsule in terms of releasing its fluid. When that happens, the capsule will break. It will then locally reduce viscosity by releasing its healing agent. That healing agent is probably going to be a low viscosity oil type product. And we're playing around with lots of different materials. We're playing around at the moment with sunfire oil. So something that's relatively cheap to acquire and seeing what that has in terms of its effect on uh, healing. And obviously once that material is soft enough to flow, because of the nature of an asphalt material as its self-healing material capabilities, it will flow and it will heal. What do these capsules look like? Well, they range in different sizes and in different properties. Some of them are coated with some form of epoxy. Some of them are coated with some form of a capsule. They can range in size from a few millimeters down to a few microns. It all depends on how much effort you want to put in terms of your manufacture. So this is an example of one that's about a couple of millimeters in size. It tends to be quite porous in the middle, because that's where you're going to contain or at least store your self-healing uh, material, your viscous fluid. These ones are slightly smaller. These ones are down at about 100 microns. Again, a slightly different approach. These are actually made with an epoxy microcapsule. So the outside uh, shell, if you like, of the capsule is some form of an epoxy. That obviously require it to be fractured before we release the fluid. And the way we've been doing it at Nottingham is by using some form of emulsifying system where you would take your sunflower oil, which is your solvent that's going to be released during the self-healing process. You take some kind of uh, alginate, which is the kind of material that would bond it together and give it its strength. You put it through uh, a stirrer and drop these particular balls into uh, effectively an emulsifying agent, uh, which allows it then to strengthen it with some kind of calcium coating or screen over the capsule. And that's what the capsules look like when they come out. They come out, and again, we can range... We can determine the range of the size by speeding up the uh, circulation in that emulsifying process. We can change the amount of sunflower oil or how much solvent we've got inside the particular mirror by changing the components. That's just a quick close-up of one of these capsules. As I mentioned before, the internal geometry is quite porous, and they can contain up to about 80% of your viscous fluid. So these contain about 80% of sunflower oil, which is then available as soon as the capsule is broken in terms of outer shell, that sunflower oil is released. It obviously localized, uh, locally reduces the viscosity of the binder, allows the binder to flow and obviously to heal the material. And we've started to use these materials in proper mixtures. So this is a study that's been done very closely with an asphalt producer in the UK. They are already adding these capsules to some of their materials. They are quite 
uh, robust in terms of their early life. You can add them to a normal asphalt plant or you can make them in the laboratory up to 180 degrees C mixing temperatures and obviously compaction energies. We can identify them if we look under X-ray C2 or if we look under uh, uh, SEM, some kind of uh, microscopic analysis, we can see them. And it takes about 20 seconds to actually produce these specimens and about 0.5% by mass of capsules to give you a fairly good distribution inside your material. Relatively cheap, relatively quick process. And that's what they look like when they're inside an asphalt mixture. These are quite big capsules. We, this we've done deliberately so we could see in this particular trial where the capsules were and how big they were and how robust and how strong they were once they were produced in the asphalt mixture. There obviously are some that had fractured. So some of them during the production process will break. That's inevitable. They will release their low viscosity fluid, in this particular case the sunflower oil, and they will locally change the properties of the material in that vicinity. So how does it work? Exactly the same way as what we did with the induction heating thing. We have a, a particular specimen. We subject it to some form of loading to fracture it or to damage it or to break it. We then place some form of a membrane. This is important because obviously healing will occur almost instantaneously. We want to separate that healing effect until we're ready to test. So we put a membrane between the two individual particles or in individual pieces of asphalt. We place it into a pressure container where we can apply load, which will load and therefore activate those capsules. We reduce that membrane or take the membrane away, and then we retest. So what do the results look like? The results actually were very, very encouraging. We do see some fracturing or some reduction in the number of capsules during the production process, but that's usually only about 1.5%, very, very small amounts. And then we see massive increases in terms of healing strength, in terms of uh, self-healing of the material once those capsules break, where we can get anywhere up to about 50% of them breaking, depending on, firstly, the dosage. So these were done with three different dosage rates, and also in terms of the type of loading or the type of damage that we're experiencing in our material. How do they work in terms of time? It's not instantaneous, obviously, that low viscosity fluid needs to locally reduce the viscosity of the binder, which needs to flow then before it can actually do any kind of self-healing. So there is a time effect. There is also an effect, obviously, of the amount of capsules you have in the material. So we've gone up to about 0.5% by mass, which tends to give you your highest amounts of healing. And what is the effect of temperature? Well, quite clearly, because temperature, again, is a mechanism to reduce that overall viscosity of your binder, this process will tend to work a lot quicker and potentially maybe better at higher temperatures. So there's an argument for possibly combining it with the induction heating process. But that's not what we're doing at the moment. We're very much looking at these two processes separately. What does it do to the material? Because this was a concern that the asphalt producers had was you're adding a material now that's going to cost money. It potentially will allow our material to self-heal but what does it do to its other properties, particularly early on in the life? And there are subtle differences. It is slightly lower stiffness, so you'll see there's about a 30% reduction in stiffness because of those capsules that initially break during the production process. They will release that low viscosity fluid and inevitably they will have an effect. But the other properties aren't that different. And so we are fairly comfortable that if this is done correctly, we can end up with a material that is effectively a self-healing material. That is my last slide. I want to thank you again for giving me this opportunity to uh, come present here today and obviously to visit Costa Rica. I'm not crazy about presenting at these things. This is really what I enjoy. It's probably too early. I know we've got one more presentation to go, but uh, I am looking forward to that first uh, beer when this is finished. But again, thank you for coming today, listening, and I will obviously be around for the next 15 minutes or so to get some questions if there are. I do quickly want to acknowledge some of my uh, colleagues who have contributed. I've mentioned some of them already. Alvaro Garcia, who's done a lot of work on self-healing. Uh, Nabir Ahmed was my PhD student who looked at the moisture damage stuff. Davide Lopresti, who again has presented at this previous event, I think last year. Anna Jimenez, my postdoc. Ahmed Bastin, who did a lot of the initial work on service energy when he was doing his PhD at a and James Grenfell, again, one of my previous colleagues at the University of Nottingham, who is now in Australia, did a lot of work with the moisture damage stuff. Professor Yed Massad, who some of you will know, 
who again I worked very closely when I was with him, with him in Texas. Uh, Ambrose Taylor and Bamber Blackman, the two professors at Imperial College that helped develop the Peel test. Alex Apigier and Jay Zay Zhang, who were my uh, postdocs and PhD students respectively that did a work on the Peel test and on the development of uh, moisture damage uh, testing. Brescia Gomez, who did the healing stuff, and finally Richard Elliott, and my previous colleague and good friend, Andy Kolop. Thank you very much. My question is about self-healing asphalt mixtures, specifically the, the ones that need to be healed to improve their properties. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, thinking about warming the surface, how much do you warm the surface in order to avoid oxidation? oxidation? oxidation. That's a very good question. Uh, what we did initially when we were looking at the, the, the heating aspects, in other words, using heating to reactivate the binder and obviously heal whatever defect there was in the asphalt mixture. We looked at two approaches. The first place we looked at was using infrared. So infrared does pretty much what you've just described now. It heats the material in terms of the whole bulk material increases in temperature. It does heal the material because obviously the bitumen then becomes activated and does flow. But as you mentioned, it does cause problems with aging. It also causes problems that the energy consumption that you need to heat the material in terms of the quantity of material is, is massive. When you use induction heating, you're only locally heating the material. So if you only got 0.5% by mass of, say, a steel fiber or a steel wool inside the material, you're only heating that 0.5% by mass. The bitumen around it, obviously then, through thermodynamics, becomes warmer, and that then, then starts to heal and flow. But not all the bitumen is heated up. So we are not that concerned that you've got change in the mechanical properties of oxidation when you're using the induction heating approach because it is using such a small, focused amount of energy into that particular material. Thank you. Okay. It's late. About those technologies of self-healing, mm -hmm. what are the future that you see regarding the, the application of these technology, technologies massively? Okay, so what's happening in the UK at the moment is that Highways England, uh, which as I mentioned is the governing body that looks after the Street DG Road Network, has just invested uh, about a quarter of a million pounds worth of research income to look at taking that technology to the next level in terms of its application in real materials. So it will be probably based around the capsules. The induction heating process is possible and has been used in the Netherlands, but it is expensive in terms of the infrastructure, and also there are concerns in terms of how it would have an effect in terms of uh, traffic management in the UK because of the high volume of traffic. You need someone to physically drive on the, on the road to actually do the self-healing with the induction heating. So my guess is that there will be some form of a capsule uh, the technology at the moment is at a point where we can produce capsules that are relatively fine. The problem is at the moment we still don't really know how we can activate them in terms of how do we make sure that the capsule is in the right place and effectively is broken at the right time to release some form of healing agent. And that's where the work on uh, using moisture as an activating me medium is, is going to be quite important. That's the latest research now. Can you have a, a coating that effectively disintegrates when it becomes moist. And what about the response of the industry regarding to Well, to as I mentioned, we've machine. got one industrial partner. So one of the asphalt producers in the UK has taken that technology on board, mainly at the moment to look at potholes. So they're very keen to have a, a potholing uh, replacement material that has capsules in it that effectively will allow it to be more beneficial in terms of sealing potholes. So it's very, very small applications at the moment. It's not going to be a, a full asphalt mixture. It's going to be very dedicated amounts of material for a particular application. Okay. But, but they are involved and they are basically using the material. 